Welcome, friends, to another Napa Conversation. Today we're joined by someone who's no stranger to any of you, <laughs> Father Robert Spitzer. And uh, Father, besides for being a co-founder of the Napa Institute, is, is most famous for his work on reason and faith. Um, but among our group, he's most famous for his 10-minute or 5-minute recaps after everyone gives a talk <laughs> at Napa Institute, in which he not only tells us what we should have gotten out of the talk, but tells the speaker themselves what they should have <laughs> conveyed in that talk. So, uh, <laughs> Father, it's great to have you with us. Before we get started here, we're going to have you open us in prayer, if that's okay. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. Ask uh, your blessings upon the Napa Institute, the Majas Institute, and all with whom we work, we ask in a special way to send your Holy Spirit down upon us to inspire, guide, and protect us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Father. I remember, you know, we met for the first time seven years ago when I first started at NAP Institute. And right. uh, one of the things that most excited me about meeting you is besides for being familiar with your great work, I, I studied a little bit of physics in college. Yeah. I've always loved that intersection of faith and reason, which you are so brilliant at uh, kind of proving the existence of God and showing us how faith and reason are, are very much comparable, not at odds to each other. Um, and you do that primarily through the Magis Institute. So maybe for those who aren't as familiar with Magis as they are with Napa, you could just give us a, a short explanation of what is the Magis Institute and what are you guys accomplishing? Right. Uh, the Magis Institute is devoted, as you said, to faith and reason, um, mostly uh, you know, looking at the, uh, um, the problem, uh, especially um, the, the faults uh, um, um, in dichotomy between faith and science that the culture has kind of set up and a lot of kids are believing in. So we address a lot of our material to millennials and we show uh, that faith and science are not incompatible. They're not contradictory. In fact, they really are more than compatible. They complement one another. And there's a huge amount of evidence for God from science, a huge evidence, uh, amount of evidence uh, for the soul from science. And interestingly enough, um, the Shroud of Turin has undergone a tremendous scientific investigation that again, points to the reality and resurrection of Jesus. So the scientific evidence is really out there. We just need to get it to the kids. It matters a lot because as yeah. the Pew survey said, 42% of our kids are going to leave. Yeah. They're not just the Catholic Church. They're going to leave faith altogether if we do not get this information to them and show them that God is not only rational, it's completely compatible with the best that we have in science today, the board of Lincoln and Guth proof, the entropy evidence, the fine tuning constants, et cetera. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's a real struggle for people is we get so stuck in the temporal, the material, um, we forget all about that spiritual. And that's one of the things that you do so well bringing it to life. One of the most uh, popular talks we've ever had at Napa was your Shroud of Turin talk a few years oh, ago yeah. on our YouTube channel. It's still doing very well. So oh, great. if you haven't seen Father's talk on the Shroud of Turin, I, I, I suggest you go there. And also you've given talks on Eucharistic miracles and other things that mm -hmm. can kind of bring the faith to life without just proving the existence of God from a standpoint of physics or astrophysics. You can also look at these great miracles and how there yeah. are unexplainable things that just point to God's existence. Absolutely. When you see a cure that... Um, uh, never happens really outside of a miraculous context. It occurs immediately uh, and, and then it has a lifelong effect. Um, you know, you look at some of these cures and they really are remarkable when yeah. limbs are completely healed, uh, you know, that have atrophied and I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, yeah. tubercular reactions that, that uh, where you have a distended abdomen with so much um, well, abdominal fluid and, and uh, just huge hard patches everywhere. And all of a sudden you pour Lourdes water on uh, the stomach of that person, the abdomen of that person, all of a sudden the, the entire you know, mass goes down yeah. and the person is completely cured and they're moments away from death and they walk up on their own accord and uh, live for another 52 years. Yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, that actually got a Nobel Prize winner to turn his head. Yeah. And um, uh, Alexis Carroll, and um, as they say, there's a whole lot of those coming out of Lourdes and Guadalupe. It's uh, qu quite remarkable. No, and, and it, some people, it's a needed element to the faith to kind of yeah. help them along. Oh, yeah. Now, you, one of the hardest working people I know, um, and uh, <laughs> besides for all the work with Majis, prolific writer, um, 
you recently finished a quartet of books, uh, a set of four books on mm -hmm. um, happiness, evidence for the soul uh, and God from science and philosophy, evidence of Jesus, and then finally a book on suffering. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about that quartet, why you chose to write it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of fill in the listeners a little. Yeah, I think um, I was trying to address the major difficulties that our young people have to face today. Uh, the first one is our, our young people, they don't believe they're happy. And uh, the evidence for that is in the last 12 years, um, you know, in this very vulnerable age group of teens and um, early 20s, uh, this group of uh, people have had a 63%, this is 12 years, 63% increase in depression rate, 63% increase in anxiety, a 56% in, uh, percent increase in suicides, a 22% uh, increase um, in, um, in uh, 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 homicides, and then uh, almost a doubling of substance abuse. And you start looking at this and going, these kids are, um, they're not happy. And the reason is a lot of them don't even know what happiness is. So we need to distinguish a little bit between what I call happiness one, which is you know, materialistic and pleasure, sensual pleasure, then uh, level two, which is ego comparative, you know, who's achieving more, who's achieving less, who's more, got more status, less status, more popularity, less popularity, et cetera. And then level three happiness, which is contributive. Now we're moving into a positive direction, right, where we're talking about, you know, trying to make an optimal positive difference to my family, to my friends, to, you know, the culture, to my church, to the kingdom of God, et cetera. And finally, level four happiness, which is what really matters, and that is the happiness that comes from being connected with God in relationship with God through church, through personal prayer, which, um, uh, of course, uh, brings ultimate happiness and, in the end, eternity. So uh, we, we try to distinguish this and show them what the problem is. And the problem is what we call the comparison game. And that really is causing this rapid increase in depression, anxiety, suicides, homicides, etc. And um, a little too much to talk about today, but yeah. we try to straighten that out in the first book. Uh, in the second book, we're really looking at evidence for the soul and for God from contemporary science. So that would be uh, contemporary medical studies of near-death experiences, con contemporary medical studies of terminal lucidity, which in my view prove, uh, you know, beyond the shadow of a doubt that you do have a transphysical soul that's going to survive bodily yeah. death. All the physicalist explanations, they don't work at all. They don't explain this phenomenon. How do, how do you know, 81% of blind people see perfectly accurately, better than any courtroom witness, right, and report data that's going on outside of the hospital, you know, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, when they're, when they're clinically dead, flat EEG, fixed and dilated pupils, no gag reflex, just mere uh, sputterings of neurons in the lower brain, no electrical activity at all in the cerebral and f frontal cortices. So, I mean, you look at that and you go, well, wait a minute here. Um, there's something very, very unusual going on. And Absolutely. so, you know, we try to say, okay, yeah, you do have a transphysical soul. You're not just a bunch of atoms and molecules. So that's a point of that um, of that uh, book. <coughs> and then in the third book, <clears throat> we really do want to establish the historicity of Jesus. So we look at historical evidence from a variety of different points of view. First, external sources, non-Christian hostile sources in particular. So like Flavius Josephus, a Jewish uh, historian writing for the Romans uh, and particularly for the emperor. And then, of course, uh, Cornelius Tacitus, totally hostile uh, to Christianity. <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, Josephus, of course, testifies to the fact that Christ not only died uh, of crucifixion during the uh, procur time of the procurator Pontius Pilate, but that he was a great man with that, uh, who actually did perform a lot of miracles. Yep. And uh, in addition to those uh, miracles, uh, uh, he was really well esteemed. Um, uh, we also have Cornelius Tacitus, who no question says that um, uh, Jesus uh, was uh, uh, prosecuted um, and suffered the extreme penalty under Pontius Pilate, et cetera. Um, we have the Babylonian Talmud, again, hostile source. All these things uh, very close to the time of Jesus uh, are really, really important uh, testimonies to, to the fact that Jesus 
of course, existed. And a lot of kids think, you know, we have no sources outside the New Testament. We have plenty of sources. And in addition to that, we then go into the historical criteria and the historical evidence for that, especially uh, the data that was put together by N.T. Wright. Fantastic yeah. set of books on, you know, the resurrection of the Son of God. Um, you know, it's, you know, one of these 1,000 page, 5,000 footnote kinds of uh, texts, a very good scholarly edition. So we had to put it in kind of popular form, uh, which we did. And then, of course, we get right down into the scientific investigation of the Shroud of Turin, which shows in most fascinating uh, uh, form that uh, the probable origin of the image on that shroud is a burst of vacuum ultraviolet radiation lasting only one forty billionth of a second, but having a magnitude of six to eight billion with a B, billion Those watts. big numbers, yeah. Yeah, big, big numbers. Half, half million searchlights worth of light energy are emerging from every three-dimensional point in that corpse in order to produce that image, while the body literally turns mechanically transparent. It turns spiritual so that the cloth can penetrate three-sixteenths of an inch to get a layered MI, MRI effect, right, uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging effect of, of the depth of the, of the body on the inside relative to the skin and yep. to the wounds on the outside. Uh, uh, utterly unbelievable. Yep. And so people really need to look at this thing. It's, it's uh, been validated again and again by multiple scientific teams uh, in, um, in Italy and, um, and beyond. Uh, so it's uh, really uh, 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 quite a, quite a, uh, yeah, absolutely. a relic. Something that can't be duplicated even today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, uh, it would take 14,000 eczema ARF lasers to do that. That's more than all the ultraviolet radiation uh, in every single laboratory in the world today. I'm not kidding you. Yeah, no. That's what it would take to produce that image. I remember when you, when you gave this talk in Napa, you were so excited and you gave all these data points yeah. in it, and it was kind of like, you know, it, everyone <laughs> knew it was mind-blowing, but yeah. you kind of put it in the terms. That yeah, no, it is mind-blowing. It blows everything. my mind, and I've been studying it for several years. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then finishing that with the, yeah. the difficult topic of suffering. Now, all of these yeah. books, what we'll do is we'll link... Uh, the uh, pl spot where you can buy all four of these, mm -hmm. and then also this new trilogy that's coming out of books from mm -hmm. Father. So literally, we can uh, we can keep you all reading for most of 21. Um, just oh. uh, Father will keep you busy. So let's move into the trilogy. Um, so Father's writing a new trilogy of books. The first one, which is out recently, it's called Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives. Um, so the cosmic struggle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. um, very important work. Um, with first of three. Um, uh, Escape from Evil's Darkness is the second one, and then the last mm -hmm. one, which I believe you're going to be giving a talk on at Napa in July, yeah. is That's Moral right. Wisdom of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. Defense of Our Most Controversial Moral Teachings. Yeah. Um, so we'll get to those two books in, in future conversations, but I really want to concentrate mm -hmm. on this particular book, because mm -hmm. one of the things we're going to talk about at Napa this year is a point we made a little bit earlier, and that is that we get so stuck in the material world that we forget the spiritual reality all around us. Mm -hmm. And not just the spiritual reality of, of evil, but the spirituality of good as well. Mm -hmm. We forget that, you know, we, we, we kind of let go of everything if we can't see and measure it. So yeah. uh, talk to us a little bit about that particular aspect of this book, how you kind of bring people back into the reality of mm -hmm. both the good and the evil that's around them. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the big problems, as you already intimated, is that a lot of young people, first of all, don't even know that these moral norms that are out there are their best protection against the evil spirit. And, of course, the reason they don't know that is because either they believe in an evil spirit in an occult fashion, uh, almost thinking that that evil spirit is harmless, which it is not. Yeah. You start messing with the occult, you're liable to have your house haunted. You're liable to be obsessed or, or oppressed by an evil spirit. And if worse came to worse, like Robbie Mannheim, one of the exorcism cases I cite in the book, uh, you'll get possessed. Now, but that's that's one thing. I mean, you've got all these kids who are you know dabbling around with Ouija boards, and they think they're just nothing's going to happen yeah. uh, to them as this planchette is moving around the board on its own. It's not your will that's moving that planchette. So, I mean, that just, just for uh, clarification's sake. But uh, the other thing is, is a lot of people uh, who have a, what I call, analytical or scientific inclination think, oh, the evil spirit, a medieval invention at best, a mere historical acronym. And now look at what's, uh, you know, happened to us. Uh, you know, we, we, we now believe that these little figures, cartoon figures in, in red tights with little horns and tridents are walking around. Isn't that quaint? Yeah. Well, actually, 
Uh, that's not what the devil looks like. That's not what the devil acts like. A cartoon figure, hardly. Yep. I mean, this is a malevolent spirit of immense power. However, the name of Jesus, as we'll talk about in a moment, is your best protection against that malevolent spirit. And of course, those moral precepts and the sacraments uh, of the church. These are your protection. Now, uh, the, the point, of course, is if you don't know you need protection, right? If you don't tell a kid not to cross the street without looking at, you know, both ways, uh, you know, that, that's a problem. We, we probably ought to alert people to the fact that, well, you know, we've got this huge problem today where now the Catholic Church has to have not just one, but probably two exorcists in every single diocese because people are actually dabbling in this stuff. So I thought, first things first, let's take a look at, is, is God really present in, in, in the world today? So uh, chapter one is, how does God speak to us? How does the Holy Spirit manifest himself in our life? How do we know the signs of the Holy Spirit in consolations and in desolation when the Holy Spirit is guiding us and protecting us and inspiring us? How do we recognize these signs? How do we play into these signs? How do we follow the Holy Spirit when he manifests these signs? That's the first uh, you know, part. I even get into the whole area of Christian mysticism where God is present in these intense forms of consolation, desolation, desolation, this real um, mystical union or love, uh, you know, um, relationship with the Lord. Then in, in the, in the uh, appendix to the book, uh, I talk about 20th century and 21st century um, contemporary validated miracles. So I have a whole lot of them on the Blessed Virgin Mary. I also have a lot of them on the saints. And then um, I have one uh, Eucharistic miracle in Buenos Aires that was overseen by Pope Francis, actually. Uh, um, uh, but at that time, he, he was Cardinal Bergoglio. But um, uh, that, uh, uh, that really is fascinating because uh, it's not like a, you know, a little blood stain on the Holy Eucharist. Uh, it really is um, uh, you know, a piece of um, the Eucharist actually transmuted, transformed into a piece of uh, heart tissue uh, right from the upper uh, left uh, ventricle. And um, it's uh, really remarkable when you get into the, to, to the interstices of it uh, and the uh, microscopic investigation uh, of the white blood cells that are embedded in the ventricle wall. That is the, and, and it's just literally, uh, uh, you know, it's transmutated right out of the actual Eucharistic bread yeah. into the uh, heart tissue. Now, it's truly amazing. One of the most fascinating miracles I, I've seen, and it, it's also yeah. one that I implore every Catholic to, to learn about because yeah. it helps you approach the Eucharist with that, that kind of real awe uh, that you should approach it with, the real reverence that you should approach it with, understanding that, mm -hmm. yes, you know, we, we believe this is the true body, but then you look at these miracles and it's heart tissue of a man who is suffering. It's like yeah. all of this uh, um, comes into one, things that couldn't be explained away by science. Now, you do talk a little bit there um, about the kind of the diabolical forces in the world. I think believing in the devil is harder for people than believing in God many times, um, and especially in modern culture where we've kind of erased them and then kind of replaced them with all these other little evil things. It kind of harkens back to C.S. Lewis, and, yeah. you know, best thing a devil can do is make you think he doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. But uh, let's talk a little bit about that, you know, how the spiritual forces of evil operate and why wouldn't God just prevent them? Yeah, well, because we're the the answer to the second question is really easy because we have free choice, and so of course uh, God says, okay, um, you know, you I created you in my own image and likeness. I've given you freedom of choice. Um, if you want to dabble in that, you can. You don't have to, and you know, if you don't dabble in it, you're not going to get affected by it. But if you decide you're you're going to want to dabble in this, get ready. You do not know who you're messing with. And so I, I decided, you know, well, let's take the first case of Robbie Mannheim. Uh, Robbie was, uh, uh, you know, one of these uh, teenage boys, uh, very, very close to his aunt, uh, who was a spiritualist lady, uh, taught him how to use the Ouija board, taught him how to conjure spirits, things of that nature. And uh, Robbie kind of got accustomed to it. But he was a very introverted young lad. And, and uh, basically, she was one of his best friends. And when she died, he wound up being exceedingly lonely because, you know, after all, he, 
he was used to being around uh, his aunt and, and spending a lot of time with her. So he thought, of course, what does he do? He takes out a Ouija board and says, I'm going to communicate with my aunt via the, the, the Ouija board. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the, the planchette is moving around on the board, you know, on its own, right? And it's spelling out the name, this, I'm your aunt, you know, ba 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 ba. And of course, he becomes convinced that it really is her, but it was not her. Yeah. Of the course, devil we, deceives. oh yeah, very much the devil deceives. And, and he definitely deceived in this particular case. And um, so much so that he possessed Robbie. It took 39 exorcisms from a team of Jesuits. By the way, they were all basically academic Jesuits, um, you know, uh, with PhDs at uh, St. Louis University. Uh, very objective people, but they performed this exorcism uh, and kept a very careful diary of it. And um, uh, I was able to read that entire diary because it's now possessed. <laughs> it's now published in a book called Possessed by Thomas Allen, uh, which is a, um, uh, he published a whole book in the back, and he went through the archives at Georgetown University. The, the, the exorcism started there at Georgetown, and then um, uh, in the Georgetown University Hospital, but it had to get moved to St. Louis for a variety of reasons. Um, and then, um, uh, you, <laughs> you cannot believe it. I mean, there's no doubt uh, that the devil was very, very present. The, the paranormal activity associated with Robbie was unbelievable. I mean, here's a kid sitting in his chair, and the chair is zooming across the room. Zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> like something like, out of Hollywood. Yeah, on, on, yeah, right out of Hollywood, you know, on and so on. These are big, heavy chairs, right? Objects are flying around. You come into the room with a religious article, and it's literally, it's being torn out of your hand by a force that you can't even see, right? And, and uh, you know, relics are, are being, you know, uh, tossed out the window. And, and of course, Robbie's levitating off his bed. And he went to a, a Lutheran, uh, uh, you know, minister uh, right over the, at the uh, first, because uh, Robbie's family was, was Lutheran. And of course, he said, well, I'm sure this is a psychiatric phenomenon. And the parents are going, no, I don't think so. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, there's really <laughs> psychiatric phenomenon. They don't create <laughs> levitation. Yeah, that's right. So he goes over to the, 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 the poor minister's house. And of course, uh, you know, he's not only levitating off the bed, you know, he's, he's taking the whole bed with him, yeah. you know, and the minister's beginning to look at this and looking at the paranormal phenomenon going, he calls up Robbie's parents and says, you got to talk to a Catholic priest. They really know about these things. I've had it. I'm, I'm not dealing with it anymore. Of course, uh, then once it gets off the ground, um, you know, in, in at Georgetown, goes to St. Louis, et cetera. But what's interesting about um, uh, that phenomenon is, you know, Robbie could do things that, like, speak Latin fluently. Yeah. Now, you, he never studied a word of Latin in his life. He's a teenage, typical, you know, teenage kid, you know, no, no, no Latin background, and yet he's conversing with the first priest who's doing the trial, you know, he's doing the testing, you know, and he, he speaks to him in Latin, and Robbie speaks right back, you know, and, and of course, with a voice uncharacteristically, uh, and, you know, not Robbie's, yeah. but uh, very, very low and, you know, very um, uh, ponderous and evil voice. So, of course, the, the long and the short of it is it does proceed, but that 39 exercise ends up with this remarkable appearance of St. Michael the Archangel literally pointing at uh, Robbie's abdomen and basically ordering Satan out of that body and when he comes out I mean the entire church a college church as you know I, I, I attended St. Louis University for my master's degree in philosophy it's this beautiful church that's on the campus well originally the exorcism started nearby there but because Robbie was so uh, loud and obstreperous and violent, uh, they moved him to the Alexian Brothers Retreat House all the way across St. Louis. And of course, when the devil came out of that, uh, out of Robbie, uh, it, it, he went right back to where the exorcism started and went right into the college church and boom, this huge bolt of thunder goes right off. You know, as all these priests are saying mass, uh, you know, in, uh, in college church uh, at the side altars there. And then after the booming, all the lights go out in the church and then flicker back on and, and Robbie was free. Didn't even have a remembrance that's, that's of anything that happened. Better, better than what they write in Hollywood. So. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's truly remarkable. Oh, William um, Peter Blatty based his book on it, yeah. uh, the, the Exorcist. Yeah, I think you have, um, we're going to talk about this a lot at Napa this year. We're going to have an yeah. evening session after dinner, uh, one of the mm -hmm. nights where we're going to talk about the spiritual realities of good and evil. Yeah. Uh, we'll have an exorcist present talking about mm -hmm. um, remaining vigilant. There. And that's one thing I want to talk about before we wrap up here is, um, so uh, most of our viewers here, they're, they, they're good Catholics. They understand that the, the, in their lives, you know, they're made 
Um, they're made for God, and God is all that's going to give bring them happiness. But a lot of them struggle with temptation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's certain sins. I always hear people say, you know, I go to confession, I confess the same th sins, and the priest says, yeah. like, that's fine. And plus, your sins aren't unique to begin with. Yeah. How do we deal with temptation? Is temptation truly a sign of the devil at work in our life? And if so, or if not, how would we deal with those temptations? Well, temptation can begin with ourselves too, yeah. right? I mean, we can uh, sort of play into it through our own free choice. But don't think for a moment that if we start playing into a temptation, normally it begins in the imagination, right? So you start off a little fantasy world, whatever you want, uh, toward any one of the eight deadly sins, vanity, uh, lust, greed, uh, pride, um, uh, you, you, anger, envy. All you got to do is let the imagination start yep. getting carried away, and the skids are greased. Then, of course, you know, the, uh, the evil spirit's going to come right on in there. And what he's going to do is stoke the imagination with every imaginable image that he can that will delight you. I mean, it could delight you in your anger, delight you in your pride, delight you in your greed, delight you in your, in your lust, delight you in your, in your envy, delight you in your vanity, right? It could, you know, all he, he's going to just get, get going and keep pushing and pushing. Have you ever wondered why you are so particularly uh, imaginative yeah. when all of a sudden you're entertaining something which... It really could send you awry, could really hurt a lot of people, that could really damage you. And all of a sudden, you've just got this active imagination that, that you go, wow, I had no idea I could be so creative, <laughs> you know. And, and of course, yeah, of course, I think he's very much stoking those temptations. And that's why the old adage of the saints is so important. Stop the temptation when it starts. Yeah. Don't entertain it. Don't let it go because then you're just allowing yourself, uh, you know, to get tempted uh, uh, by the devil to kind of move forward on this thing. And, of course, God is not going to interfere with your freedom. He will not. Yeah. But if you start saying, you know, just a, a little prayer like, in the name of Jesus, be gone, Satan. Uh, the name of Jesus is so utterly powerful. I mean, yeah. just, you know, in deliverance ministry, I can tell you. The devil cowers before the mere mention of Jesus. He hates the word, yep. absolutely hates it. And you can tell as you begin to say, you know, the power of Jesus commands you, you know, people scream. I yep. mean, literally, they are yelling. And you're doing nothing but holding your, 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 your hands out like this, you know, in, in, in blessing. And, uh, you know, you can tell uh, that, uh, that this is really a, a, a very, very powerful uh, you know, name, but you know, so we, you know, Jesus has defeated Satan. Make no mistake about it. I devote all of chapter two to that subject, yep. but uh, we can pray for it. Confession is so important to keeping the devil at bay. And of course, these techniques of moral conversion, which I talk about in chapters uh, uh, five and six of my next volume, my second volume, are really, really important. But for the time being, just uh, know this, that if we, you know, are taking advantage of of a sacrament of reconciliation of the Holy Eucharist, and we're also, you know, trying our, our best, uh, you know, to use what I call the examine prayer or some other technique to deepen our moral conversion. Uh, at the end of the day, if you need the name of Jesus, use the name of Jesus, and I use it all the time. I use noble intentions, uh, my three noble intentions to defeat, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, temptation, and I also uh, uh, use the the examine technique, and and you do, you make little progress. It's not. You're not going to make leaps and bounds progress, but little progress you do make, and little progress over the course of time turns into big pro uh, progress, and of course uh, um, that that makes all the difference. Excellent. Yeah, we're running a little short on time here, but I do. Yeah. Well, that's one of the pieces of advice you've given in the past that I really like is have a have a prayer like that handy, something very simple. Yeah. Um, and and I think that's fantastic. And and you talk about how we get creative when we're confronted with the evil thinking that we are creating, but we're actually destroying. You know, mm -hmm. it's, only, it's only God and His love that creates, and, and the evil things we do actually destroy in our lives. So, mm -hmm. um, so much wisdom, and I, I implore you all to get a copy of the book, uh, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives, uh, the first of a trilogy. Uh, Escape from Evil's Darkness comes out in March. It comes and out. then Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, uh, Defense of Our Most Controversial Moral Teachings, that'll come out in the summer? Uh, uh, yeah, that's in right. Summer. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, Father, we appreciate having you here. We look forward to seeing you guys all uh, soon at either an in-person event, uh, a Napa conversation, or at one of our digital conferences. Um, we are having, uh, going forward with our July conference uh, at mm -hmm. the end of July in 21 here, Father, of course, as always, will be present for a talk, and his talk will be specifically on the book that will be newest at the moment, which is The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church. So, 
Thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Father. Thank you.